Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, also known as Dharmasar Tero, and I'm here with the 17th installment of this series on Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Now, We've been through quite a few different topics in this series so far. And I want to make it clear that this series is meant for advanced students of the teaching of the Buddha. In other words, you should have some background. You should have some practice, serious practice of meditation before attempting this series. If you don't, you will misunderstand it, I guarantee. <laughs> so on our site, uh, dharmasar.wordpress.com. There are other courses meant to bring you up to speed. Please go back and take the courses beginning with matrix learning and go through them to understand the background, the context against which we are speaking. So why is that important? Well, context determines meaning and context also determines what you can be conscious of. For example, if you are in a black room with a black rug at midnight with the lights off and a black cat walks through the room, are you going to see that cat? I don't think so. But if you're in a white room with a white rug at noon and the windows are wide open like they are today, are you going to see that black cat? Yes. Why? The context allows you to see the contrast between the cat and the background. This foreground and background context is what makes meaning. So if I'm talking about Nibbana, which is a very subtle, very uh, difficult subject for anybody, and you don't have the adequate background, you're not going to see what I'm talking about. You're not going to get the meaning because the meaning is dependent on the context. Let me give you another example. Take any small word and or if but such for then that etc. All these small words have many different meanings. Look up in the dictionary and you'll see. Uh, up for example, has at least 23 or 24 different senses. So which of those meanings is the correct meaning in a particular context? You see? That word changes its meaning exclusively dependent on the context. Let the balloon go up has a different meaning from fill the glass up. Doesn't it? So in this way, the small words are typically the words that are misunderstood and they completely change the meaning because they are the words that connect things, that show the relationship between things. And if we get the relationship wrong, then our understanding will be completely off and we won't be able to apply the information. So something very similar happened in the development of what we call Buddhism. Now, I don't actually recognize Buddhism as a thing. Well, why is that? Because it's a construct. It's a semantic structure. It is simply a collection of words. Now, the Buddha's teaching is a thing. The Buddha came and he realized Nibbana, and then he taught for something like 45 years, according to the histories. So, the best we've got, the most accurate record we've got of the Buddha's teaching is the suttas, the Theravada suttas. These were memorized and passed down by the Buddha's close disciples. And at a certain point, they were written down about 2,000 years ago after the second convocation, second conference. So what does this all mean? Well, since then, 
a number of people have written commentaries on the Buddha's teaching. And probably the most famous one is Buddha Ghosh. Now, Buddha Ghosh was not a native Buddhist. He was a Hindu Brahmin who converted to Buddhism, became a Buddhist monk, and went to India, sorry, went from India to Sri Lanka. And there he wrote some very influential commentaries, probably the best known of which is the Visuddhimagga. The Visuddhimagga means the path of purity. But how many people know that the Visuddhimagga was based on an earlier work called Vimudhimagga? And how many people know that once uh, Visuddhimagga was completed, that Buddha Ghosh attempted to burn all the previous manuscripts and notes relating to the subject of Vimudhimagga, trying to uh, actually make it go out of existence. Now, is this the act of an unmotivated, a detached, uh, neutral, passionless person? I don't think so. I think it showed that he had a deep attachment to making a name for himself and that he wanted to get rid of all previous authorities so that they would be forgotten in the future and only his work would remain. Who knows the motivation for th things like that? <laughs> we can only guess, but he's certainly not pure like the Buddha. He's certainly not teaching with an open hand ready to share everything. He's got some secrets. So we also want to teach with an open hand. We don't want to have secrets. That's why I'm recommending that you go back and you go over all the materials so far that we presented on our site. There are six or seven courses of uh, complete video courses with supporting material. So you should go through those courses to get an idea of the background so that you understand the meaning of this work. So we're talking about the meaning of Nibbana. And Nibbana is an undefined term. In fact, it's an undefinable term. Now, this is another thing about semantics and context and ontology and all this. Every semantic system whether it's nuclear science or the Buddhist teaching <laughs> or Christianity or any kind of ism or belief system, has got at least one undefined term, undefinable term. And that term actually constitutes the unspoken or tacit assumptions of that system. There's no way around this. Because if all the words we have to communicate are the words in the dictionary, then how do we define the words in the dictionary? You see, all the words in the dictionary are defined in terms of one another. So if we try to say, well, this is the root word from which all other words are defined, then the thing becomes hopeless. You see, for example, in Christianity, God is the central figure, the central term, or Jesus is the central term. And then people try to define what God is or what Jesus is, and they always get in a tangle because then the other definitions that depend on that term become contradictory. So the Buddha said Nibbana has to remain undefined and undefinable. Nibbana is by by definition, beyond everything else. Nibbana is the goal. Nibbana is the end. Nibbana is the object of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, Nibbana is also the power by which the Buddhas have their uh, existence. Well, <laughs> you see, here we go again. Language is really messed up because one definition of Nibbana is the cessation of existence. Yet the Buddhas exist by the power of Nibbana. Without Nibbana, you don't have Buddhas, you don't have Arhats, you don't have enlightened souls. 
So anytime we try to talk about Nibbana, we always get tangled up in words. Therefore, the Buddha tries to use metaphors instead. Instead of direct definitions, he uses indirect definitions like pictures, like stories. And he makes many, many stories, many, many metaphors about Nibbana. So, for example, the fire simile. We've been talking in terms of the fire being out. And when a fire goes out, where does it go? It doesn't go anyplace. It's simply the end of the conditions that cause the fire to exist. And similarly, Nibbana means the end of the conditions that cause I and mine to exist. So when I and mine go out, when they're extinguished, when they cease without remainder, that's Nibbana. Now, what has to happen? Practically speaking, one has to attain a state of ecstasy. We find in uh, artists, musicians, athletes, in the erotic arts, uh, in fact, in every art, that the artist is one who knows how to attain a state of ecstasy, or we can call it a state of flow, uh, where there's nothing in the way of the flow of the practice of his art. Like runners get into this. They get into flow where all there is is running. There's no runner anymore. Uh, musicians get into it too. When you're in an improvisational situation with a bunch of other musicians, there is no room to think, well, what am I going to play next? As soon as you do, you're out. You're not with it anymore. You're not making the changes. Because thinking is too slow. Thinking depends on definitions, and definitions are pointers to other definitions and words and so on. So thinking is not going to cut it in a situation like that. Or in the middle of an intense sport a uh, team sports uh, contest or something like that. You don't have time to think. You have to simply react. Twitch, it's called. Uh, or a fighter pilot in a dogfight. He doesn't have time to think. He has to be so well trained that his reaction is just instant, as quick as possible. That's called being in the flow. When you have mastered something so well that it becomes part of your being, when it sinks into your bones, you don't have to think about it anymore. You simply act and you go with the flow. So this is samadhi. This is concentration. This is one of the preconditions for Nibbana. You have to be so into your practice of meditation that the self disappears, ego disappears, thinking disappears. In fact, that's one of the first things to go in meditation. The second jhana is characterized as without thought, without discursive thought, huh? that constant nattering and yammering inside of our minds, talking to ourselves. That has to go before anything higher becomes possible. But when that space opens up where there's no discursive thought, then ecstasy can happen. Uh, during an orgasm, for example, and nobody's talking to themselves, hmm, I wonder about that meeting tomorrow with the boss. <laughs> during an orgasm, <laughs> there's no room for thought. Uh, people seek out experiences like this. Why? Because they naturally concentrate the mind, and they naturally lead to a state of egolessness, selflessness, a little taste of samadhi, even if it's only momentary, is worth so much to us that we're willing to try anything. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, <laughs> or dangerous sports that demand total concentration. You see? This is how important this state of flow is. And a state of flow is only one precondition for nibbana, for enlightenment to happen. But it's a very important one. If we can't let go of our intellectual, conceptual 
uh, discursive thinking. We can't get near to Nibbana. We can't get near to even good concentration or the higher jhanas, for example, the immaterial jhanas, as they're called. Unlimited space, unlimited consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. These are the most beautiful, most interesting states a human being is capable of achieving. But they have to be achieved without the mind. So, when we're studying, when we're trying to understand the meaning of the Buddha's teaching, we need a coherent set of ideas, a coherent set of conce concepts, where they're completely harmonious with one another, and where they're completely harmonious with the idea of Nibbana. And so we talked about the fire going out. Well, what does that practically mean? It means the end of craving, the end of desire, the end of lust, the end of trying to make things different from the way they are. To just settle into the moment and allow the moment to be just the way it is, without any thought, without any desire. Okay, this is cessation. This is nibbana, extinguishing. Extinguishing desire, extinguishing the self, extinguishing the process of eye-making and mind-making. Extinguishing not only desire, also hatred, aversion. I want this, I don't want that. Both of them have to go. And also ignorance has to go. So how do we get rid of ignorance? Well, it requires some training, some education. And that's what we're trying to do in this series. So <laughs> the, the reason why we pick on Buddha Ghosh is because he argues quite extensively against the Buddha's point of view. The Buddha says that, practically speaking, Nibbana is the cessation of desire. So what does Buddha Ghosh do? Well, in his Visuddhi Magga, and also in some of his commentaries, he sets up an argument, a debate, between a, a heretic and a Buddhist monk. And then he takes the Buddhist point of view and puts it in the mouth of the heretic. The heretic says, well, when you destroy a craving, then you attain Nibbana. And then he... Be, uh, he begins to defeat this argument, to defeat this point of view in his commentary. Now, I'm not saying that we should go out and burn all copies of Visuddhimagga and try to forget that Buddha Ghosh and the other commentators ever existed. That's something that Buddha Ghosh would do. But that's not something that we're going to do. We don't want everybody to start hating on Buddha Ghosh. <laughs> he was trained in the wrong way. He was trained in uh, Shankar Acharya's school of Brahminical study, where if you don't like the meaning of a text, no problem. You just go back to the definitions of the word roots of the terms in that text and redefine them. And then, no problem, the text says whatever you want it to say. Now, personally, I have a problem with that. I think if we start using words and giving our own definitions to those words, language breaks down. Communication breaks down. For example, if I say to you, I'm thirsty, I want a glass of water. And then you bring me a glass of milk. And I say, what's this? I don't want milk, I want water. Well, water is a liquid and milk is a liquid. So by giving you milk, I'm also giving you water because you can extract water from milk if you put it through a filter. So there's already water there, but wait a minute. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want water mixed with milk. I want just plain water. Oh, you mean milk. No, no, no. You see how this can get out of hand? So this is what happened 
to the Buddha's teaching. And this is why there are innumerable schools of Buddhism today who all disagree with one another. Because nobody is willing to go back to the suttas, the original statements of the Buddha, and simply take the direct dictionary meanings. That makes everything so simple. There's no interpretation necessary. Now, the problem is, if you hear what the Buddha has to say, and you have never practiced the Buddha's instructions, you might have a hard time understanding, well, what is he talking about? How is this going to work? And so, to make the Buddha's teaching uh, credible, to make it uh, understandable to a wide range of people, the commentators thought they had to change some of the terminology to increase the Buddha's credibility. Uh, but the Buddha doesn't need anybody's help to be credible. All he needs is for you to actually follow his advice. If you do this, you will find what he's talking about is correct. Let me give you a good example. In the last episode, I said, you have to take the choice between the yoga process and the Buddha's process. Because the Buddha's process is the opposite of the yoga process. And then I got several messages and comments that, well, what do you mean? <laughs> And I thought I had explained everything quite clearly in the video, but I guess not. What I mean is that yoga is the path of will to improve and develop and make the will stronger so that we can control things. And the Buddha's path is a path of surrender, a path of letting go. Instead of making I and mind bigger and stronger, the idea is to weaken I and mind until they disappear and we can just let go. Then nature itself will show us many, many things. The insights that are revealed in deep meditation are not only extremely beautiful, but they're impossible to describe in words. So the Buddha is saying, come and see. Come and do this method and then see what opens up for you. There's no way to predict what you're going to see. Not even the Buddha could tell you that. <laughs> what we can say in general, yeah, you're going to see that this whole ego thing, I and mine, is just a big story. A story that we make up and we tell ourselves and we tell ourselves over and over and over again many many times a second it's a habit and it takes a lot of energy it takes a lot of brain cells <laughs> the other day I saw a comment in a meditation forum that when I'm meditating I I feeling I'm feeling like there's a knife going down the center of my brain <laughs> I thought this was a great comment. He was very concerned about this, you know. <laughs> I've experienced this too. And I call it brain surgery. <laughs> because it is. What's happening is the brain is restructuring its connections. Restructuring the associations between the left and right lobes. Restructuring the basis of consciousness itself. And what are you going to see? What are you going to experience when you rewire your brain? Well, nobody can say, nobody can tell you. You have to experience it for yourself. And that's the real meaning of Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta